Okay, thank you very much, Ditliff. And again, <laughs> great afternoon. And it's a very exciting one today because once again, we'll be speaking uh, to Patrick Sam about basically investing into, into in, in arts, the investment platforms and then how and what the National Arts uh, Council um, is up to in that regard as, and we also hope to hear from people in the audience um, what your inputs or your thoughts uh, may be so that we can have an open discussion. And we are privileged to have Sam, uh, Patrick Sam here. And I believe Patrick, you have a presentation uh, lined up that you want us to go through. Yes, Harry, uh, the first part of the presentation will be a uh, PowerPoint. And then uh, the idea really is to engage in the second half ideas awesome. around how we can strengthen uh, the digital ecosystem, particularly for public institutions. So yeah, if you guys can just share that, uh, I've got it on my computer here and I'll go through that. Okay, uh, let me see, let me, can I give you screen sharing abilities? Yes, I think he, I think you do have screen sharing abilities, Patrick. Okay. So the challenge is I'm on my phone and uh, the presentation is on my computer. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. Ah. Let me. Okay, so, let me let me um, share it. Okay, okay, great. Thank you. Okay, um, so yeah, today's talk I think fundamentally focuses on uh, digitizing public investment uh, in Namibian arts, culture, and uh, heritage. Um, I think the reason why I think this is an important conversation uh, is because I think as a public institution, particularly when it comes to public institutions, we have to ensure real values that are upheld in terms of uh, issues around access, uh, inclusion, uh, issues around literacy. Uh, so I think the paradigm in which we find ourselves, uh, given particularly the, the pandemic, um, the real question is, is the digital space going to divide the world and increase the gaps and increase inequality, uh, real issues that are at hand, or is the digital space or digital tools going to bridge uh, a lot of these inequalities uh, that we might be experiencing? Um, and I'll obviously be speaking from a perspective of the National Art Council. Uh, yeah, and as soon as you guys are ready uh, with the presentations, I can continue. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, Patrick, maybe you can tell me what is the name of the presentation? I've got different... You just but emailed it... it to us. Okay, it's not, I can't see on the follow. Is it a PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Okay. Then please, you don't know the name of the presentation, the farm. It's Digitalization of Public Investment in Arts, Culture and Heritage. Oh, sorry, I can't see that on the file, but I will quickly. In context. And in doing this presentation, I think I'm going to ask three critical questions that are on the next slide. Uh, I'm going to try and answer two of those. And then I'm going to leave the third one uh, to be answered by us as a group together in the discussion uh, to ensure that a lot of your inputs are also then included uh, in what we're going to do uh, after this. So the first question that we're asking uh, today is, what is the role of public investment in arts, culture, and heritage, particularly in the digital environment? Uh, the second question is, how does this digitalization affect the production and consumption of arts, culture, and heritage, uh, particularly by the National Art Council? And thirdly, how does the National Art Council create an enabling environment uh, for cultural and creative sector? And so I think the third question everybody needs to be thinking about in the presentation, how do we enable this environment, but I think I'll go into addressing the first two questions and then opening up uh, the third one. Um, the next slide really looks at this, this question. And I think as I was speaking on the panel on Friday, um, the International Federation of Art Councils and Cultural Agencies, um, which is obviously a, a, a global body of over 17 <laughs> members and affiliates uh, from around the world that, that look at 
public money essentially. So keep money that is owned by the people or that's invested from the taxpayers or that is invested or given through philanthropy through public institutions. Uh, and how does that public investment, what does it really require uh, during this digital phase is really like the, the big question that's been asked here. So how do, how do we consolidate um, uh, the answering of those questions that I was asking around access, availability, um, uh, that the world experiences in terms of uh, this, 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 this digitization. Uh, and I think that um, if you guys are really able to provide us with a consolidated um, ecosystem that, that, that enables us to interrogate a lot of these, these, these issues uh, that, that come up. So the first thing really is to look at how do we consolidate the economic sustainability of the digital value chain? Uh, that is a very important question. And, and so how does, how does that happen um, from the perspective of public institutions like the Art Council? Um, I think one of the biggest issues that we need to realize is that, that, that a lot of the times in public policy, we had really separated the issue between lives and livelihoods. And I think um, the digital divide, the infrastructure accessibility, issues around skills, gender, race imbalances, lack of visibility. I mean, things around like, you know, unpublished works that are registered copyright infringements, uh, the low remuneration and the value gap. AI, who holds the rights in, 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 in the changing kind of ecosystem, intellectual property, uh, traditional cultural expressions, do they have a place uh, in the current status? Looking at issues of censorship, um, what, what do we do in terms of training, creation, experimentation, understanding trends and the digital needs of artists, uh, promoting digital inclusion, protecting copyrights and ensuring fair remuneration. Uh, you know, these are just kind of the extensive issues uh, that, that, that we have to look at uh, when we're dealing with public policy. So uh, what I'm trying to get to here is that the consolidation is a complex process. Uh, but just because something is complex uh, doesn't mean that we can't understand uh, what the drivers are, what the enablers are uh, of, of, of such issues as well. So I think really to answer the question of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of the first issue around who are even the actors in, in, in the sector, right? You have artists, you have audiences, you have the industry, uh, you have internet platforms, you have startups, uh, you have universities, you know, you have various forms of expressions like music, visual arts, publishing, film, performing arts, video games, heritage. Again, this is a complex ecosystem. So when we're talking particularly about um, how do we consolidate uh, the, the, the sustainabilities, we have to really understand how we're going to include are uh, all of the actors um, that, that, that have a role to play here. Um, the next variable looks at support, uh, the experimentation and, and they develop essential skills and knowledge. Um, that really speaks to the challenge of, uh, especially in, in developing countries, we want to promote, you know, whether it is digital goods or service, but nobody is given financing to go and experiment um, you know, for instance, let's think about the vaccine or let's think about any pharmaceutical companies where, 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 where people are given funding opportunities to do research uh, and to experiment and to trial uh, and, and fail at innovating certain things because there are lessons that get carried on towards the development of new products. So a lot of the times you'll see that investment is very skewed uh, in this regard towards either just finalized goods or products, but in a, in, in a, in a, in a digital ecosystem that's not mature, uh, that becomes very difficult. Uh, and therefore it's important to then uh, support experimentation and develop skills 
uh, and knowledge while doing that. So labs become very important in this. Hubs become very fundamental in creating uh, this, this kind of enabling uh, in environment. The next issue talks about uh, the promote, promoting and pr protecting and promoting the visibility of diverse digital culture. Um, again, I mean, if we, if we just think about issues around like broadcasting um, in countries and, and the, what the broadcasting access towards local players versus, for instance, international players that get to broadcast on, in, in the country, whether you're talking about Netflix um, and, and, and how that ability to broadcast is, 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 is actually not at the same level when it comes to the promotion of local content uh, as, 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 as other institutions are forced currently with like a 15% local content production rate versus a Netflix that, that can air and essentially broadcast in Namibia, but they're not obligated to, to have Namibian content on their platforms, but other people that have the broadcasting license, uh, because essentially it is about Namibian consumers and um, whether the, the, the Namibian consumers are spending their dollar on Netflix. And as a result of that, us having an expectation through these broadcasting platforms uh, to promote local content. So there's a big conversations that are also being had in countries like Canada um, that, 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 that they're looking for international solidarity and saying, uh, as public institutions, we need to hold all the players that broadcast in our country to the same uh, level and responsibility, uh, particularly when it comes to the promotion of local content. On the next slide, uh, you'll see that the expectations carry on. So um, we need to guarantee digital inclusion for all stakeholders. And that really has to do with the tools, the devices, connectivity, um, access uh, that people have when it comes to these issues. Uh, because it's one thing to have the platforms, but issues around data, uh, universal access, um, and, and talking about data as a human right, uh, it's a rights-based issue. That, that's a particular interest of the public sector um, so that there are no barriers of entry to the digital space. Also remember, as public institutions, we, are up, up, we need to uphold constitutional values. Uh, a, a lot of the times we need to focus on particularly historically marginalized people, indigenous people, marginalized groups in terms of people with disability, uh, how are they getting access and opportunity and how are their rights, vulnerable communities, um, impoverished communities, um, sexual minorities, uh, we're talking about communities that are in rural, informal spaces. How do they actually have access and, and are able to create their narratives onto this digital space? Uh, because without that type of protection of fundamental rights, the digital space becomes a tool for further, whether it's cyberbullying, whether it is, you know, uh, a, a space that monopolizes uh, income for certain groups of artists with more privilege because you have more skills and tools to navigate the landscape. So again, the protection of fundamental rights is important. Uh, strengthening digital data and analysis ecosystem. Um, a lot of the times, even on social media, uh, looking at our analytics and having targeted interventions between the relationship between artists, cultural wow. practitioners, and even a lot of the audiences, uh, making sure that there is cohesion there. And how do we use the digital space to really implement effective systems and internal processes? And, and, and lastly, how do we foster collaborative approaches? I think uh, it's important that the digital space is not divorced from what happens offline uh, and that the nature uh, of, of just human beings is to connect and to be significant. So how do we do that both on, online and how do we use our connections offline and extend those communities online in a meaningful uh, manner. So I think these really uh, eight factors talk about some of the issues of, 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 of how do you consolidate this at a policy level. But let's talk about some of the practical things of how uh, when, the, when the Art Council launched its relief fund last year, who were some of the beneficiaries, what are some of the objectives? So the objectives of the Art and Culture Relief Fund in terms of how does the Art Council play an important role? Really. Ours was as a fund to provide fuel um, towards, again, remember our, our, our mandate is to develop art, 
And, and so I think this was a big clash between the art council and the art community. Uh, what's the focus on? Is it the lives or the livelihoods um, of, of artists, particularly uh, with an institution that is given the mandate to promote artworks produced, made by Namibians, with Namibians. So really the focus is on artworks and how do we con allow for the continuation and the creation and the consumption of Namibian art and cultural goods and services, uh, that being our primary focus. And, and, and one of the biggest ways was obviously through other initiatives like the waiving of the NAC membership fee, as well as developing a e-commerce platform for Namibian crafts uh, as well. So I'll just talk to you about like my two projects I think that had a huge impact uh, during this period. Uh, the one on the next slide is a silk project uh, that comes from um, uh, the Kalahari Well Silk Manufacturers. They're from the Omayake region from Leonardville. Uh, it's a community members mostly made of women. They got $75,000 um, as part of their relief package. And, and what's incredible about this is because the market was shut during the COVID relief period. And, and so what, what Kalari Silk identified the need at first to get financial assistance to procure vital raw materials uh, from local suppliers, as well as to procure pots, chemicals, coloring, transportation of materials, etc. Uh, the project consisted and then benefited directly 13 women and had indirect beneficiaries, 92 people from the village of Leonard uh, Ville. Uh, this included cleaners, spinners, weavers, uh, and, and obviously the people that were directly giving the, the supplies. The output of the project was to produce material made of raw silk, and sold on the available market platform. So uh, the participants of the project uh, guaranteed direct income, and this allowed them to then cushion some of their losses that they'd experienced during COVID. And again, this speaks to how public funding directly affects the lives of women, particularly those in rural communities. And so even when we talk about digitization, it's those are just tools that enable people to either access funds but then they continue doing their work, but then they can sell the goods again on other platforms and stuff like that. And so um, that's important for us uh, to ensure that, that, that we keep on affecting and impacting people's lives and livelihoods, even though we're using a different platform uh, in this instance. The next slide talks about a project that happened in the informal uh, space uh, in Namibia, and that was the France Arts Training School. And Again, the project involved five visual artists who trained approximately 30 participants. The disciplines involved printmaking, color science, textiles, weaving, recycled art and music classes. Uh, the France Art Training School was established uh, obviously pre-COVID. The parents of the children participated usually carried the cost. And so now during the funding, uh, sustainability during the COVID period became challenging and income was lost. So the funds were mostly allocated for art materials, a generator for the school, a sound system uh, and folding tables for the kids. Uh, part of the funds were also applied to assist with safe transportation um, as taxi driving became risky for children during the peak of COVID. And so you'll see that that, that level of engagement again has a direct effect on, on, on creating an enabling environment for people to still access their daily services. Uh, just to give you in the next slide, a, a brief overview. We had six rounds of, of funding distributions uh, that were given, you'll see in the first round that was noted in July, August, August, September, to November. In the first round, we had 35 approved applications to the value of 300,000. In the second round, we had 15, 25, 43, 4, 59, and we ended up with 85 approved applications um, worth a total value of about 4 million. That just went to either, this is the individuals, organizations. Uh, we also had another funding stream that went to the public institutions, uh, for instance, like the National Gallery, as well as the National Theater of Namibia, uh, as well as the Museums Association that was sponsored 
uh, with Heritage Week uh, and, and those other types of supports that took place on the digital space as well. But this is just to give you an understanding of, of where the funding went directly uh, to individuals uh, and groups over cycles uh, of period. Uh, and then now just to get to the final, you know, because I would really want to leave a large part of the conversation to be interactive. Uh, the next slide really asks the next question of the digital ecosystem and what does it look like um, for artists, for art, for cultural practitioners, uh, and basically uh, for art lovers. Uh, back to you, Harry. Thank you so, so much, Patrick. Let me turn on. Yeah, great. Yeah, so first of all, I want to say thank you for uh, coming out with all the with, with uh, the presentation that is quite transparent. Uh, because a lot of times uh, coming speaking from an um, from an artist's perspective, uh, a lot of times uh, as an artist, we are very focused on what we want to do, what we want to produce, and what we would want to share with fellow Namibians and the world at large. And yet, we do not necessarily take into consideration the broader ecosystem. And through your presentation, I'm gathering that it would actually be beneficial for artists to have this broader understanding. Are you of the same opinion? Or is it possible that maybe you know artists continue what they're doing but as we've developed the ecosystem and create this value chain other entities come into play for example art dealers you know they're not necessarily the artist but they understand maybe the business aspect logistics and distribution and the e ecosystem at large so they come in and plug in to an artist that they want to assist um how, how do you see it ideally playing out for the Namibian artist in general? I, I, think, I, think, I think, you know, this, let, let's figure this out. You know, um, artists are the vehicle. Um, they need fuel to get to various places. Uh, we also know that not every single car uses the same source of fuel. All right, so some cars use electric energy, some cars use biomass, some cars use petrol, some cars use diesel. All right. right. So I'm talking right. about a particular type of fuel, okay. uh, the fund, the fuel of, of public investment, because, you know, if you have a private investment, they have their own criteria. So if you go mm -hmm. to, for instance, Bank Vintage, they might have, if you go to a philanthropist, they might have a different standard. Uh, if you go to a, 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 a somebody, you know, who, who invests in arts. So, so my, my point is that there's various funding models for artists. Right, and, and one is the criteria that's expected to receive public funds. Because the question is, like any other thing, that the demand is very high for public funds, but the supply in terms of the funding that's available is very limited. So when you have limited funding, but then your demand is very high, your criteria for access to the funding must be of a level that it actually is able to achieve your core objective, which is to see the visibility and promotion and preservation of arts, culture, and heritage, right? And I think this is the first clash that we had as the Art Council with the artists and the cultural practitioner community, because they were like, no, we need money for our lives. We need, we need funding to survive. We need funding to make up our loss of income. And our mandate is to, produce, to give funding to artists that are producing work. Right. Because it's public funding and it's limited. So in that, how do we ensure greater uh, like distribution of funds? It is to say at the same time, we know that society values the production uh, of art and therefore we need the people to be fueled with that. Right, right, right. So basically, as you mentioned, it, it's the necessary fuel to keep that, those particular vehicles that fall into the criteria to keep moving. For example, like, like you're saying, you know, like a petrol, for example, some use biogas, some use electricity and that sort of thing. But then there's a range of certain vehicles that would use um, petrol in yes. particular. Artists in terms of investment, artists can access various types of funding. Mm -hmm. A lot of corporate, I mean, even the conversations around advertising right now and some of the laws that are being promoted and how that's going to curb alcohol laws, access to alcohol funding for, for, for artists. These are conversations that we need to be aware of that there's not a single source 
of investment, even when it comes to being digitally present or monetizing of the digital space, right? right so so it's, right, right. It, essentially it is to say, when you approach an institution like the Art Council or other publicly invested, the, the, the criteria is a little bit higher. And the criteria is a little bit higher because our focus with, with, with public money is to ensure that our interests align with, with national development, uh, that our interests are aligned with human development, uh, that our interests are aligned with issues of inclusivity, that they are aligned, you know what I mean? So, so, so it's not just like we're a private company that can decide, hey, uh, and, and also you know, conversations around artists that have lost their lives, um, and, and how do we use the limited funds to support that? Uh, what is our position? So there's a real deep conversation around significance uh, of artists, cultural practitioners, particularly when we are digitizing. Right. In fact, I, I, just to take a step back, uh, what sort of criteria did you use to determine? Because you, you did mention they have to be active and productive um, and that there is interest from consumers so on and so forth. What, what other criteria do, do artists need to take into consideration before approaching the Arts Council? Well, I think well, there's one in terms of our own criteria, you know, which are very clear around, it, it's either for an individual, it's either for a project, uh, it's either a group or an organization. So there were very streams, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that you could apply for. So that was the first criteria. Uh, are you applying as an individual? So you had a max, amount of money. Um, and then you obviously, that was $2,000. And then as a group, it was $75,000 that you could apply for. I think for us, the most important criteria is what's the relevance of your work? Right. All right. Um, 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 in, in terms of that, our other criteria are looking at dis distribution, the regions you're coming from. Um, so sometimes you might not just get the funding because 20 projects were from already awarded from Ventook. So we want to distribute the money. We also look at issues around gender. One of the most amazing works that came out was uh, our allocation of funding towards the NTN for, for work with people with disabilities. And I think you've seen it, you know, the stories that are coming out surviving the odds. That's direct funding that's coming from uh, the COVID relief fund because it's targeted at, at the relationship between people and what art and culture, that's what we're trying to feel. What's the relationship between people and art? Not just, oh, I made art, but like, is it relevant? Is it consumed? What emotions does it spark? Is If an artist has the ability to express the human condition, how do we use the digital space to, to extend those markets maybe into global or regional markets? So how do we give them access to their products you know, in, in, in terms of a market? So I think it's, it's a lot of, Going digital does not make the issue less complex, is my point. Yeah, okay, I, I, I get that. Um, and one of the things that I'm thinking now is like, okay, great. When you speak in terms of relevance, in terms of uh, artists, uh, you know, what artists are producing, um, I'm, okay, I'm coming from a very, from a very, let me, let me not say a very broad perspective, because there's a certain group of artists that uh, I might have a bit more insight in, uh, than others, but I think this might just be a general issue that artists might face. The ability to express the relevance of what they are doing in the human context. So for example, um, in the panel discussion that we had on Friday, there were certain, I mean, when they looked at uh, robotic and digitalization, coming up with solutions for certain things, one might, you know, even a student in a robotics class might not necessarily be aware of the potential solution they're offering or the value that they're contributing to society in general. Is it, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, Artists that are unable to recognize the value that they're giving in terms of culture, heritage, and, and even just artwork that maybe, you know, um, solves a social issue or addresses a social issue in a relevant way. How, did, how, how was that navigated? Or was it a case that everybody who understood the value of their art was able to express it accordingly? <coughs> Um, 
you see, I, I think I, I don't want to generalize the conversation. I think what I want to, the perimeters that I want to stick to mm -hmm. is how do artists access public funding, particularly in a space where there's digitizing? It's, it's, it's the issue of not just funding or resources in general, because the strategies and the tools are different uh, based on what source of fuel you want. And I think I want to be very particular about people who want to access public funding and, um, and then sometimes feel excluded or sidelined as a result of not accessing that funding. Uh, uh, and, 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 and then for us clar clarifying what, what, what is relevant for public institutions when it comes to giving the people the fuel. And I said, again, it might be different for a bank, it might be different mm -hmm. for another individual, but there is a certain decorum when that, that, that is required when it comes to accessing public funding, particularly when we're functioning in a digital space. Right. So, for example, like like the um, the France arts training. Um, what? Um, okay. Other than the 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 students, you know, still getting to be able to learn these skills and that sort of thing. What were the ripple effects in terms of you know fulfilling your criteria and 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 actually adding relevance to to not adding relevance but expressing that relevance of what they were doing. Okay, so if you're looking at, for instance, uh, artists, right, and our responsibility towards artworks, uh, and then looking at issues around mobility. So France and Binga, first of all, lives in an informal settlement, in an informal space, uh, where the idea is people that live there can't get access traditionally to any activity around arts or anything that is productive within the promotion of informal art education. So part of our, of our art council strategy is really to look at eight things, you know, looking at compliance, looking at resource mobilization, resource distribution, sector development, education, uh, partnerships, NAC and led activities, and we want to impact and inspire. So part of our strategy here is to support informal art education. And in supporting art informal education, we know what that means because remember the nature of why this why the sector is so significant is that it gives anybody and like the, the, the barriers of entry, right? For many other sectors is really high. This sector has a very low barrier of entry. So in terms of providing opportunities for people who are commonly disenfranchised, it gives them that ability. Now, if we giving digital migration a priority, are we saying that people who traditionally just painted now that need to sell their artworks, don't have the data to update them or you know, have a nice profile or have a quality picture or all of these things that are required? Because remember, you just don't need the skill anymore when we digitize, you also now need the tools. Right, right. Right. So this, this having the skills and the tools means that if you are not positioned well, then you can't move on in society. So you, you have less access of mobility, upward mobility, you have less opportunities of growth because now you don't have the tools and the digital space requires you to have the tools in order to have access to the market. Right. Mm -hmm. In order to have access to people that demand those goods and those services. So Franz Naminka becomes a player, very important because one, he first ensures that there is skills development at that grassroots level in an informal setting to a community that is traditionally disenfranchised. That's important in terms of relevance for us as art council. So Harry, what I wanna say is that I think public investment is a little bit different because a lot of the times we also cross the barriers of entertainment versus culture, right? Yeah. And I think those conversations, but I think the, the nature of public investment is that we use arts, culture and heritage uh, and the digital space as tools for human development. That's right. why the criteria of the funding that's so limited is a little bit higher than everybody else because funds are limited and this is the people's money. So right. if you want the people's money, there is a high expectation that you are gonna have a greater effect on the money that you get on, you know, uh, what I was talking about on, 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 on human development, on people by using this vehicle to express the human condition, to tell us their stories, to interrogate the issues in our societies. I think that for us is a greater value. Uh, we think that other things around entertainment are, are funded by the market naturally, or there is demand for that. People buy tickets. So again, that's not our priority a lot of the times when it comes to public funding. Right, right, right. So for example, so again, we, you know, just to use France as an example. Um, so the, the, 
the value that he was bringing was not only just necessarily the art skill, but also another, you know, the necessary links in the value chain in order to make this uh, process uh, viable. So for example, even now with uh, digitalization, so let's say someone who's not necessarily an artist, but is an art lover. And for example, you know, like uh, this morning we were talking to people who, who capture art using technology so that their art can be, can be seen, um, you know, on digital spaces and they facilitate that process. Uh, would they also be considered for funding? For public funding, because yes, of, I mean, mm -hmm. yes, I mean, people like like that's the thing. Like the 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 the, the, the aspects around public funding are multidimensional, mm -hmm. right? It also is a wide array. Like, what part of the the value chain are you fitting? So, I think it, it it depends on that. But I think it's not wise to, you know, like not not acknowledge that privilege plays a huge part in those people who have access to digital tools. Right. So, so, so as somebody who's in charge of a council that manages public funds, it's an important area of focus for us to, 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 to tell the people who want public funding that it's important, like uh, that you think about the effects of, 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 of our interventions. Uh, I mean, traditionally we did it as well. If you're gonna apply for funding to have a performance, um, you know, and you'll see a lot more performances are in, in, in spaces that there was not traditional, um, um, like theater, for instance, where it's taking place, a lot of the shows. Um, so, so yes, it is strategic to say that it's not just about the art. It's not just about the, 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 the product or the service. It's also about who consumes it. It's also about um, how viable the longevity of that. You know, it's, there's no algorithm Right. access in public funding but there's definitely insight that you can have uh, that we spoke about you know those those eight variables that you can include how does this you know form part of the economic value chain how does this for instance uh look at issues of data there was a question that was asked i think that's relevant i think that we can address at this point yeah. uh that i can answer but it is does the national art council have any projects directed towards uh, data gathering in light of data phobia what can be done to disseminate uh, gather data. So, yes, uh, one is we will be working with the director of arts and our international partners, UNESCO, um, to already uh, kind of look at national data. But because we are part of the international federation, we've already started a national profile there that looks at, for instance, things like what is the per capita investment into arts and culture from the Namibian government, right? Um, so we know it's about 220, depending on exchange rates because they were studying US dollars around that the Namibian government invests annually into the arts and culture, right? So yes, um, what we do in terms of data gathering, for me, one of the things that we need to understand about particularly data that's gathered by public institutions is that through things like access to information, um, you know, the, the bill that, that, that could, that, that's on the way to being an act, um, it, is, is, is that public, it's, it's, it's information and data is a good and it's essentially a public good. So it needs to have public regulations that ensure access, uh, people have access to it and that its utilization is not used for criminal or corrupt activities, right? But essentially right. information and data are public goods and it should be protected by public regulations in the interest of the people. Um, so we have two issues, uh, two projects coming up. One is really, and that's you know my question to, the, to everybody here is, what does it look like when we talk about a digital ecosystem that, is, that can be provided by the Art Council what are the needs of artists uh, or, or, or art managers or people in the cultural space? Um, uh, because we are going to invest in a digital migration, for instance, where you can <clears throat> access and get support services uh, through digital platforms uh, in the future as well. But what does that look like um, for artists is really my question. And to, there's another question here. Um, where, which, which asks, has the National Arts Council of Namibia or Federation investigated the best practices regulating the application of digital tools in strengthening um, linguistic rights? Um, you see, 
I, I think what what but what happens a lot of the times is that there's many public institutions that are in charge of various aspects of the value chain, right? Uh, what our mandate is to really fuel the guys on the ground, okay? Right, that, to that... fuel the practitioners, to fuel the actors. It's really not to have a lot of our own work that is done. But for instance, um, currently uh, the director of arts under the ministry uh, with UNESCO and the EU have been working on an IPLC project, which is an intellectual property of local content, mm -hmm. right? And they've kind of looked at the best practice models. And there's a lot of, I think, real discussion around even issues around royalties, claiming that um, there's been huge consultations that have nationally, and they, they're moving in the direction of, of, of looking at how do they really not just look at like linguistic rights, but how do they look at protection of intellectual property, um, through the, the you know the preservation of copyrights, trademarks, um, patents, you know for, for for goods that are that are developed. So the conversation really is around IP because remember our industry as artists and the creative practitioners is entered like our anchor, our deed of sale is our IP, is our trademark, is our copyright. That's what anchors the value for you to monetize. Right. So even if you move digitally, if you're not, um, uh, you know, the people are talking about the guys that produced the song that got with six million views. But the, the question was where they registered to benefit from the royalties. You know, uh, the, the people think that the digital space is very informal, but there's a lot of formality that you need to yeah. adapt to if you want to monetize from that, uh, that that space. Uh, so those are really the conversations. Um, um, that, that the Art Council might not be doing, but we have partners in other public institutions and we will be launching, we're having a meeting uh, sometime in November with the other public institutions so that we can at least have one platform um, for all public institutions that are in the cultural value chain can come together uh, quarterly and discuss what are the strategic interests of, of creating such a platform uh, under the name Cultural and Creative Namibia. Yeah. One of the dilemmas that has been uh, brought to my attention is the fact that when we did it, when we digitalize um, culture, well, be it um, art, uh, artifacts, music, or, you know, just any, any artistic work, and when it's digitized, and should it be put on an open source platform whereby it's accessible to the world, and then it's a whole question of what you just spoke about, questions of culture copyright, how do you benefit from it and that sort of thing, especially if others are, if it's so widely consumed versus it's digitized and then who holds the, who holds the rights to broadcast or to share it um, and, and, and how does that trickle down to, to, the, to, to the artist on the ground? And I think those are very, very interesting conversations to be had indeed, because I don't think, um, it's unique to Namibia, but these are these are being discussed globally, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, but I mean, think about it, Harry. I mean, even people mm -hmm. like Bob Marley, they create, they collect the royalties in the UK. Why? Because it's a more mature structure. I think people, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes we have a very nationalistic view around, you know, even like as a supplier of art, who are we supplying this for? Uh, right. Is it just for the people in your village? Is it? And it's fine if you understand your targeted audience. But sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes we 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 create a thing that is only consumable here, but we expect it to be consumed somewhere else. Um, or if you are, if you have visibility through having relationships that you develop on networks on the continent, um, register in those places um, where they can collect for your online royalties. You know, so I think a lot of the times um, it's sad that there's not a lot of awareness and sensitization because the nature of the industry sometimes is also exploitative when it comes to art and culture. Uh, in terms of royalties and returns and payments. Uh, there's issues around, you know, even just payment gateways, uh, small claims courts, artists not being paid on time. Um, you know, like the, 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 the issues around minimum wage. Uh, these are real issues that, 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 that beyond digitization either can be compounded by it, or if, if some of the guys are savvy enough, they can create multiple streams of revenue by, by accessing other issues, you know, promoting merchandise so it really is just about the type of intelligence that people have uh, about the digital space and, and I think one of the most fundamental ones is the issue around not just having the skill anymore but also not having to acquire the tools uh, and people who usually have the privilege of the tools uh, and then 
that have the skills have a compounded comparative advantage in monetizing. Right. So again, speaking of royalties, um, and you, you did mention that, okay, you know, the guys in the UK and the US, they have much, way more advanced and mature systems so that even before they went into the digital space, people were getting their royalties, people were being paid for their art every time it was being broadcast or played somewhere. How, how far behind do you think? Okay, first of all, the fact that I would assume that Namibia didn't, had not reached that level. And then now with digitization, and especially, and also with uh, what, the, uh, what the pandemic has brought about to cause us to have this need to leapfrog forward, do you see it causing a whole lot of issues or would it be something that will help us accelerate our process? Um, you see, one of the things about the challenge of public policy generally is that public policy takes about 10 years to mature. So I'll tell you kind of the practical way that it goes about, even right now with the, with the legislation around the laws uh, that, that happen with comes to like digital territories, who has access, what are the kind of connectivity issues that come along with this, uh, the position of broadcasting rights and all of that. So, so in this complex environment, to, you can't <clears throat> really simplify the issue of royalties because it's about a model. So, so I'll give you a simple example. Um, NASCAM is the collector of royalties. One, if you as a musician, you know, you go register the song. Do you really dis like? Do you do you show who the author is? Do you show who the producer is? Do you show who, you know, like the various composer is? Um, right. So one already, the information about how you, the, the the who gets paid out already. Is, you know, you'll hear a lot of producers says, "I produced this, but I didn't get any royalties because the information that was provided even to NASCAM." So that, that's at a service level. That's a question we need to interrogate. At a systems level is was what people in Malawi did. Malawi, um, an institution like NASCAM is, is not an NGO like in our context, um, even though it, you know, it, it, it exists through a provision of, 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 of parliament, but it's a actual like SOE. It's like a, uh, it's like a BIPA. It's like a institution like NASFAF. You know, uh, mm -hmm. so it's a publicly owned institution that deals with royalties, right? So the, the, the question really is around modality um, uh, and in whose interest does the model work? And I think there's a lot of honest conversation that needs to be had uh, in terms of even the royalties that are currently collected, how much of, from every $10, how much of the every $10 goes towards the artist given the fact that even for administration, $3 must go there, right? right. So, so now we are using more money on administration purposes. So who's, where's the artist's money going? Because without them creating, institutions like NASCAM wouldn't exist. So for me, it is really fundamental around what systems we use to protect and promote the interest of artists. Uh, and, and so for me, the conversation on digitization cannot happen outside of our other conversations around art activism and you as an, as an artist, are you, do you know about the systems and how they work if your song is played on radio, for instance? Right. Um, uh, what's the agreement between uh, Tribe Studios or <clears throat> what's the agreement between NBC and NASCAM? Do you guys know the inner detail of those uh, agreements that are attached to advertising? What happens when these agencies don't pay NASCAM, for instance? What is the recourse? What's the liability? So I think here is where the law needs to play a bigger and strengthened role. But more importantly, we need case law. We need artists who are paid on, on late, whose IPs are stolen, whose copyrights are to go to court. Mm -hmm. Right, so that there is case law being built around uh, um, the, the, the issues around copyright infringements, the issues around, cop you know, so, so that that, because we have the system in place that can protect artist rights and creativity, but we don't exercise them. That's for many reasons and a conversation for another day, Harry. Yeah, no, because I've, I've heard a lot of situations whereby artists have uh, dis fallouts with either producers or the studio. And it's because, you know, he said, she said, so-and-so paid, so-and-so didn't pay. You were not, there was no agreement, so on and so forth. And like you say, building up case laws. One more question um, as we are running out of time. 
you mentioned uh, what Malawi is doing and give it a, 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 about the systems that they've put in place. Given the fact that you know they're, they're, you know well, uh, that you're also part of a, an international body, are there other countries that can provide a case study that could tra translate well into the Namibian context in terms of how to go forward? Uh, yes, I mean there's various models, but I think it's more like the facet and the reality that on the ground that's needed. Harry, mm -hmm. there's a there's a big saying in international development right now that we don't need best practice; we need new practice. Okay. Right. And, and mm -hmm. I think part of the challenge here in Namibia also, you know, that, that I struggle with as a chairperson of the Art Council is that people are always looking at best practice, but in the digital space, we need to be pioneering, Okay. right? We need to have the confidence to say that we are the ones that are thinking of these systems for the first time and are developing them in a way that even when the World Press Freedom Day took place, it was Namibian companies that were the back end of that whole digital global thing that at first people envisioned that we couldn't do, right? So it, it's really that, that idea of benchmarking, I find sometimes, is, is, is a way that, that, that brings about models that aren't culturally relevant. But what I can answer you is that we have the tools and we have enough case studies to look at um, what are the enablers, what are the drivers in various ecosystems and what could be relevant and relevant or not relevant in ours. But I think ultimately uh, we need to advocate for new practice rather than best practice. I can may I say amen to that. Um, and what, in fact, yeah, and uh, you know, it says <laughs> new practice, boom. You, I guess you dropped the truth bomb right there. And <laughs> the fact of the matter is as well, you know, like nothing is new under the sun and we can, yes, we, we can have new practices because we're venturing into new territories. And as you mentioned before, there's lots of case studies that we can look at, not so that we can adopt irrelevant or, um, you know, irrelevant systems to our context, but rather use them to inspire uh, different ways of approaching our, our challenges and moving forward. If, yeah, I hope I get okay. that right. No, 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 I hear, I hear you. Uh, now that, yeah, so um, I think, for instance, the East African market is particularly mm -hmm. interesting in terms of uh, what happens, um, and you'll see why it's different there. It's different there because it, 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 it must sound lopsided, right? But, but a lack of public investment um, within the arts, culture, and heritage has really made the private investment space interesting uh, in, in the digitalization of East African kind of new technologies. Uh, when you're looking at uh, venture capitalists, you know, um, you're looking at <clears throat> um, just angel investment, you're looking at, you know what I mean? So what has happened is that the ideas in terms of how the artists themselves the, the, the systems, what they do is their ideas are more bankable, if, if that makes any sense. And they're right. more bankable because higher needs of competition. So there's, there's, I mean, if you're looking at numbers and innovation and, and, and creativity in these places, um, because there is more of a need that like we spoke about on Friday to innovate, to create opportunity. Um, but it's also a lot of private investment that's coming in, in, in from that side what you'll see is that they, there's a lot more mentorship and an enabling environment that is targeted to at, at ideas. For instance, if, if I ask you, I'm dropping an, an album, I'm like, Harry, or I'm having an exhibition, what's your break even period for that? Hmm. You're like, what, what do you mean? I'm like, but the, the value of the economic value that you put into the creation and the production of your work, how long does it take you to make the returns on that investment? Right. And these right? are questions I, think, that you know, I, I, I always tell the maybe an artist, I'm like, um, I think sometimes what happens is the environment it becomes so disenabling that, that we, 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 we concentrate more on likes than on dollars. That's true. <laughs> and I think, it's, and, 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 and I'm not saying one is more important than the other, but, but I think they're equally more important. I think they, they, they're equally as important, but, but, but what we need to make primary is the demand for these things, who, because remember art and expression is something that's a gift and something that is nurtured and something that is a skill and something that's, it's, you know? So at the end of the day, the sense of entitlement that we have to our stories, do we tell the stories in our community? Do we tell them in our families? Do we tell them in our churches? Do we tell them in our parks? You know, where is the demand also that, of the thing that we're supplying? Um, and, and, and so that it becomes socially relevant particularly mm -hmm. when we're looking for public money, it needs to be socially relevant. Right, right, right. So, so I think East you know, Africa 
is a is a very important place to look look to um, uh, at this time. Great, you know, and you you said that that word again, relevance, and I think that is something that even us as artists need to um, explore further and see, you know, and, and recognize the value in what we're doing. As you mentioned, it's, it's, it's something about human development. And as you mentioned, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, there isn't so not, okay, in most cases, there isn't a lot of awareness in terms of the business aspect. For example, when you ask the question, how long will it take for you to break even? Again, it's, it's also on the other side of the coin, on, on the less, um, how do I say, the, the less businessy or structured side, then when it comes to the expressive side, and we talk about, you know, what is this contribution? What is it that you want to express? Um, it still receives, or it, it still, you still get the same uncertainty or cloudiness, uh, cloudiness of vision. So as you mentioned, this is a conversation that can go on for ages. There is tons to be talked about. But um, unfortunately, this is pretty much the time that we've had for this, this afternoon. Uh, Patrick, I just want to say thank you so much. And to the people in the audience, I want to say again, thank you for your contributions and your questions. Much appreciated. And I'd like to um, hand back to the Gute Institute. And one, once again, Patrick, thank you so much. It's, I feel like I've just experienced a brain overload. So. Forgive yeah, no, no that's what happens. So I think much. public policy is a pu public policy. Public policy is a lot to I think take in, but I think to keep it simplified for people that are, you know, on the grassroots level, keep it simple. Make sure that you're making the making the work, make the good or the service. Right. You know, make sure that as you're making that it's meaningful, right? And make sure that as you're making it and while it's meaningful that you're able to monetize, right? Um, and I think in that. What, what, I, what I'm trying to, just as a human variable, because you'll see even the things like artificial intelligence, a lot of the things that make it more intelligent are the things that um, are, are very uh, given in our offline world. And I think one of the biggest spaces is artists need to start working together, collaboration, especially now and, and, and co-regulating uh, the space. You know, I think the ecosystem that is very prevalent doesn't sometimes work a lot when you uh need like now saying the tools the skills and everything else so my advice is make the work make it meaningful and make the work that's meaningful monetizable okay i thought you said yeah. e ego system did you say ego system deliberately or did you say ecosystem ego system you said ego system. okay i caught that another topic for another day did yeah that's right a, that's to the you. digital <laughs> ego system versus the digital ecosystem <laughs> Can we, we have to stop now. Ditlev, please take over. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you very much, Harry, for this interesting presentation and discussion. So we're coming to the end for this session, uh, but not by telling you that the session will be uh, recorded and be available on our website so that you can have a closer look at it and review it again or share it with people they could not be live. Our last and um, session for, for today will be in two hours at six o'clock, 18, 18 a.m. Uh, we have a look at Moho's Kingdom that brings life to a library. It, it, it brings the library live with a mobile game. Moha's Kingdom is a mobile game getting children excited about reading. It brings to life characters from book dash African storybooks and can be played in 11 South African languages. So have a look at uh, this interesting uh, presentation uh, from uh, our colleagues from the Iziku Museum in Cape Town, South Africa. But with, of course, with some hints to, to Namibia, we have the book dash books here and everybody who is live will had the chance to get some of these books um, as a donation for their library or their institution. So I hope see you then at six o'clock at uh, this channel, look at our website for the, for the link and 
thank you very much again. See you at six o'clock. Bye.